Right now, we're going to discuss geomorphic process domains. Process domains are zones within the landscape where a certain set of physical, chemical, and or biological rules can apply. The reason that we need these process domains is because geomorphology is about the entire landscape on the entire surface of the Earth, as well as other planetary bodies. This makes it really fundamentally different from some other classes you might have taken. For example, in a structural geology class, you'll learn about stress and strain and deformation. In an English composition class, you might learn how to write another skill. Similarly, if you take physical chemistry, it's all thermodynamics and possibly kinetics. Fluid dynamics, similarly, fluids and their flows. Solid mechanics, the same thing. But in geomorphology, we're dealing with the whole surface of the Earth and so we have to start to think about how we can understand our system and how we can start to parse it apart into bite-sized solvable chunks. And that's one of the first goals that we have in this class. And we'll spend much of the rest of the time discussing these individual chunks and how we're actually going to build equations and intuition and conceptual models to understand and address some of these systems. And so in the picture in front of you, you can see the ocean, you can see lowlands and plains, uh, flat areas used as farmland, hills that are covered in forests, and a plateau in the background. Think for a moment about what different geomorphic processes might be happening in one of these places or another. So, as I mentioned, geomorphic process domains are broken down based on the fact that we have physical, chemical, and biological processes all shaping Earth's surface. And we can describe these processes using either conceptual models or mathematical models. And I'll get to those in the next two slides. The problem here is that it's really difficult, it's extraordinarily difficult to um, state and communicate a full theory, <clears throat> pardon me, a full theory of landscapes and how they change. For a similarly complex problem, imagine something like trying to understand the global economy in light of all possible new inventions, disasters, civil wars, strife, water resource limitations, alliances, and economic changes between different countries. This is a really difficult problem similarly. Or likewise, for these coupled Earth and climate system models that are used to predict what will happen as the Earth warms, as we emit greenhouse gases, and the related feedbacks from the plants, from the wetlands, from the glaciers and ice sheets and sea ice. For example, all of these things require whole teams of people, hundreds to thousands of people, to be able to solve a similar problem. It's, not, it's also similar to building a computer, right? The same person who fabricates the silicon microcontrollers and who designs perhaps this teeny tiny hardware is not the same person who writes the software and in fact there are many many people designing these different components so one of the things that we have to do is treat geomorphology a little bit like a giant model or an industry in which our goal is to understand protect and predict the changes on earth's landscapes so we want to subdivide the landscape into these process domains where one or another process or sets of processes tends to dominate over some others. And so the whole idea is just like when you're solving a big equation and you throw away all the terms that don't matter so much, or if you're writing the shopping list for the grocery store, right, you don't just throw everything you might need in your life on it, you throw kind of the most immediate things on it. And so in a similar way, we're going to start to break up geomorphic processes into these domains. First off, though, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about what I mean when I say a conceptual model and what I say when I mean a mathematical model, which is often input into a computer into what we call a numerical model. So a conceptual model at first is just like what we have here, where we have a, quote, young landscape with mountains and and deep rivers and sized valleys, which turns into a, quote, mature landscape with some hills and streams and so forth, into a, a quote, old landscape, which is almost devoid of topographic relief. 
So this is an idea from over a hundred years ago by the geographer and geomorphologist William Morris Davis about how landscapes evolve. And this is a conceptual model. He drew this, he based it on some of his understanding and field observations. And it's a really powerful model because it lets us think, okay, well maybe if right after some tectonic event creates a thickened piece of the Earth's crust, which is high, that can start eroding and then over time it will completely erode away. And with geologic data and topographic analysis, it's even testable. And so this conceptual model is a great way to express complex ideas without getting too bogged down in details and needing to think about how do I express all of these things that are going on in the landscape in terms of a set of internally consistent coupled equations. The hard part though is because there are not numbers associated with it, it's difficult to test beyond simple Boolean logic and falsification, meaning did it get steeper or less steep? Is the land higher or is the land lower? Are the rivers flatter and curvier or are they steeper and full of more gravel and bedrock sections? Right? Um, and with that, it's actually a little bit harder to then know what time scale these things happen over. You can get some idea, but prediction is also a problem. So from conceptual models, we can go to mathematical models. And so on the left hand side is an example, it's a fairly straightforward equation, which is linking dimensionless sediment transport rate, so there should actually be a star on that Q sub s, to the um, basal shear stress compared to the critical shear stress for initiation of motion of particles on the bed of a stream. So mathematical models mean that we actually have a mathematical relationship between variables including factors, and this is a real key point, that are measurable and or observable. So what this means is we can take something that we can observe and we can compare it and, um, and, and get something else out of it. So for example, we can actually observe the factors that go into the stress that a flow is imparting on its bed. And then we can make a prediction about how much gravel the river, the river will be able to move as a result of that stress. And so we can make these sorts of concrete predictions. And that's why math is so powerful in science, is because it's a language of logic and exact relationships that is also flexible enough to be able to allow us to understand potential for errors and, and uncertainties. So in English, you know, I might say, well, you know, that hill was about 50 meters high, it was kind of round, and it took us about 15 minutes to walk around it. You know, what does about mean? What does kind of mean? In mathematical terms, we could actually quantify the shape of that hill and use that information to be able to move forward in understanding how it formed and how it might continue to change into the future. These mathematical models often evolve from conceptual models. So for example, you know, if I know that I'm putting more shear stress on the bed, and shear stress is the kind of stress that you feel if you put your hands together and then start to move them transversely to each other, so push them together and kind of move your fingers forward, um, well, let's say your left hand forward and away from you, and your right hand backwards and towards you, that's, that's shear stress that you're feeling, and as they move, that's what we call shear strain. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, so the idea is that we can take something that we can actually, is actually a real physical quantity, and link it to something that we might see in the real world. And so taking these conceptual models into something that we can quantify makes them much more powerful, but it also means that they're more difficult to work with because we have to know some more details, right? We can't just hand wave. So whether we're using conceptual models or mathematical models, we have to go back and think about processes that shape this Earth's surface. And I just listed a ton of them here, everything that was off the top of my head when I created this slide. So thinking about wind, wind can scour rock as it brings by small particles of silt and sand that abrade the rock. It can transport sand and silt. Um, it can also drive waves on bodies of water, which leads to coastal erosion, coastal deposition, creation of beach ridges and, um, and offshore platforms of of sediment and also leads to creation of spits and barrier islands. 
Water is extraordinarily important in shaping Earth's surface. In fact, we're going to spend much of our time this semester on liquid water because it is really kind of like the number one geomorphic agent that we think about day in and day out, at least I do. So rain splash, detaching material from hill slopes, flows and currents, whether these are underwater or whether these are, um, sorry, wh whether these flows and currents are uh, you know, in the ocean or whether they're in rivers. Um, groundwater beneath the surface, which might seep through, causing chemical weathering or detaching a little bit of material. And you can also think about what ha might happen internally in some piece of land, even without wind or water driving this, such as granular soil creep down hill slopes, so soil just creeping grain by grain. And you can even think about you know, how you can observe sometimes on a uh, summer day, just looking out at the, at the hill, and seeing that there are zones where there are just little lumps of soil that seem like they're a little bit loose, and maybe these have been moving. Dry gravel, which is just dry material rolling down steep hill slopes. Mass wasting, so this is about rock fall and landsliding. And soil forming processes, so thinking about the chemical, biological, climate related processes that build soils that deepen them, that weather bedrock, and that eventually detach material and make it finer as it moves. And, and eventually that material can either pile up into thick soils or if it's on a slope, move downhill. Life, so life does quite a lot too, right? You can think about burrowing animals and how those might really affect hill slopes. If a gopher or marmot is digging into the side of a hill, it's not gonna throw the dirt that it's digging above it where it's going to fall back into the hole. It's gonna throw it straight out of the hole and down the hill so it will cause the hill to erode over time. Soil development, of course, and human land use is another major issue that we're going to touch on in this class, and that's one of the major applications of geomorphology. Ice is also a major process, and we can think about glacial erosion and deposition in places like you know, northern and central Europe, the northern tier of the United States, the southern cone of South America. These are all places that have been heavily glaciated in the past. Permafrost and periglacial processes are also an important thing. Um, periglacial just means processes that occur associated with permafrost. Um, it's one of these fancy science words. Um, solar radiation can crack rocks, especially in, in the desert environments. Tectonics can uplift mountain blocks or drop down basins, changing land surface slopes and causing there to be zones of net erosion or net deposition as the rivers kind of catch up with tectonics changing the landscape. And tectonics also fracture and deforms rock, deform rocks, breaking them down sometimes into smaller chunks that rivers and glaciers are much more capable of moving. Of course, there's also volcanoes, building topography themselves, extraterrestrial meteorite impacts, and I'm sure there are more. But this just gives you some idea. And if you look through it, you know, from wind, water, internal modification, life, ice, there's actually some amount of connection between all of these. So they're not super, super easy to tear apart because if we have driving wa wind driving waves on bodies of water, those wind driven waves might generate currents. Those currents and flow then might cause sediment to be moved. Or for example, we might have something like, um, you know, soil creep down hill slopes that's assisted by people walking along a trail or cattle walking along a trail or, or burrowing animals. So all of these will link each other to, li to each other in some way, right? We're one big earth system. But what we want to do is think about these processes and think about their similarities and their differences and how we can possibly try to make some simplified process domains in which we can think, okay, one of these is going to be more important than the others, or one of them can be used as a boundary condition. So for example, I'll say, I care about the water, and then I'll just pretend that I know what the wind is doing so I don't have to solve for that at the same time. So these all have a number of things in common, but key is the fact that they all involve classical mechanics, they all involve chemical alterations, and they all involve biological activity. And this is a physics, biology, and chemistry diagram at right. The physics one is the model of the atom. I just said classical mechanics. It just means physics. Ignore it. We're not going to deal with quantum. Quantum geomorphology is a scale that we absolutely cannot resolve right now. But in any case, it's very difficult to solve for so many aspects of science at once. And so what do we do? 
use our knowledge of landforms and processes to identify process domains. And so what I'm going to do is pause the video here and as a matter of fact stop it and we'll pick up with the next video later. Um, and I want you to take some time to think through and sketch out a set of scenarios or landforms or places or however you think you might be able to separate Earth's surface into different process domains and be able to use these process domains to explain how you can perhaps solve a problem in one or another without needing extra knowledge. And so take a little while, go through that, and I'll catch up with you in the next lecture segment.